from you, Dorn. Power with two times oil power. The combination is a huge Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another session of Intellectus Campus. Can you please all mute your microphones? Thank you. Um, it's 18.30 and the session is being run with German precision by our Namibian team. So without further ado, I'm going to start this presentation. Um, Obi is currently stuck in traffic, I think in Johannesburg. So we are going to skip the introductions. For those of you on the SADAC group, I trust you have read my bio. It um, is on my qualifications, but I would say my greatest credentials in this particular aspect are, is the Diploma in Aviation Medicine and the fellowship um, of the Australasian College of Aerospace Medicine. And I do want to focus on aviation medicine in this presentation. This presentation is one year old exactly. I gave it a year ago to TNT Radio, um, to James Wells on the Freeman show, and there is nothing new one year later. So without further ado, I'm going to start with Valentine's Day Affairs of the Heart. And while we're on the subject of aviation medicine, I would, sorry, my slides aren't progressing, guys. Here we go. Um, I would like to dedicate this presentation to a very good friend of mine, um, Captain Bud Kirkcroft, who passed away sadly last year, just after his 66th birthday. This is the helicopter crash that he survived, but he was unfortunately not able to survive the aggressive cancer that he developed. So I'd like him to, I'd like to say that I hope he rests in peace. I've just got back from Victoria Falls where he was sorely missed. And the link below which will be shared on the group later is um, a link to some of his outstanding music including sunrise in zimbabwe and dreaming about zimbabwe i'm dreaming about my home so this presentation is for you bud um, i'd like to reiterate the african solutions for african problems which is the theme for our year and i'd also like to highlight the concept of constructive controversy. We need to create a cordial environment to discuss controversial subjects, and we need to provide new thought processes and paradigm shifts in our thinking. So back to my first love, which is the aviation medicine. And this song has played so often today that I'm actually quite tired of it. The learning objectives today is to know what is the heart? How does it work? What, what does it need to work? Can you bypass it? Can you replace it? And can you avoid replacing it? Can you damage it? And how can you fix that damage? And how can you optimize its efficiency? So according to Dr. Chris Barnard, who performed the first heart transplant in Cape Town at Hrudeskir Hospital, where I trained, the heart is but a pump. And this is the engineering diagram of the heart. The right atrium collects blood from the limbs, from the internal organs, from the heart, the head and the arms, and it pumps it into the right ventricle, which then sends it to the lungs where it's oxygenated. It returns to the left atrium, goes to the left ventricle, and is then distributed to the body. 
Now, Dr. Chris Barnard, who was he? He is South African born. He was born into a poor home and after a difficult childhood, he made his dream come true by becoming the first surgeon to perform a cardiac transplant on the 3rd of December, 1967, which is over 56 years ago. His brother, Marius Barnard, was on the operating team and is said to be the genius behind it. But Chris was very happy to take the limelight, which I think is a difficult position to take. This is a mock-up of the first heart transplant ever. And the most important thing in this um, picture is the cardiac bypass machine without which the surgery would not have been possible. The recipient of the first human heart was a guy called Louis uh, Wyszkanski. He died 19 days after the transplant because he developed pneumonia based on the very strong immunosuppressive drugs that they used, which have now been replaced. So the life expectancy after a cardiac transplant is now over five years. So what do we know about Chris Barnard? We know that for all the three Barnard boys, their mother instilled in her children the belief that they could do anything they set their minds to. And the most unfortunate people are those who have been given everything because they have nothing to look forward to. So in Africa, we have plenty to look forward to because we operate in a highly under-resourced environment. Mm -hmm. Barnard was also one of the first person to do an early risk benefit assessment for a dying person, a transplant is not a difficult decision. If a lion chases you into a river filled with crocodiles, you will leap into the water, convinced you have a chance to swim to the other side. But you would never get into that river if you weren't being chased by a lion. And in the atmosphere that we've all operated since the beginning of 2020, I would say that we've been operating in a system of fear and we've dived into a few rivers full of crocodiles and there are alternative rivers that are not full of crocodiles so when barnard said the heart is but a pump he was not entirely correct because it is a very complex pump it is not just the cardiac muscle that is pumping but it has its own blood supply in the coronary artery system and it has its own electrical supply so what does it need to work it has to be filled with blood and the blood has to come from the body or from the lungs. The muscle has to work. And for the muscle to work, it must not be damaged. And it must have a good supply of oxygen and glucose, which is its fuel. And the wiring system has to be functioning in a coordinated way. So the sinoatrial node will discharge. The atria, both sides will contract once they are full. They will pump into the ventricular system. The valves will close. The atrioventricular node will delay the signal to the ventricles. And when the ventricles do fire, they pump the blood out. And it can only work if the wiring is working efficiently. So I'm going to make this talk a little less medical since it's Valentine's Day and we need to have a little bit of fun. And storytelling is a huge part of African culture. So I'm going to tell you the story of my old year's eve in 2022 when I was going up to see my friend Bud Cocroft in Victoria Falls on the 31st of January 2022. And we... You're going to have to bear with me because the story of fixing this engine in the middle of nowhere may help you understand that infectious diseases that kill people in Africa are often diseases of the blood and the inner lining of the blood vessels. And that sometimes you have to do whatever you can with whoever you've got and whatever you've got. And that was the story of fixing this engine. Now, we were in the best vehicle of all time, a 100 series Toyota Land Cruiser. And for those of you familiar with the Toyota philosophy of Kaizen, this, I think, was the best vehicle they ever made. It's built to last. It's consistently reliable. It can deal with any terrain in any weather. It can pull something twice its weight out of trouble in almost any environment. It's comfortable. It's reliable. It's trustworthy. But it can't deal with Zimbabwean potholes. So the road was pretty bumpy and rough. And 300 kilometers out of Victoria Falls, we smelt diesel, which was all over the windscreen and all over the car, and realized we were hemorrhaging 100 liters of Kuwait's finest onto the Bulaway of Victoria Falls tarmac. 
One of the fuel lines, not dissimilar to an artery, had come off the fuel injector, the heart of the engine. And it made me think. We stopped the bleeding with what we could, which was a bottle top cap um, that we found in the grass on the side of the road. And we made it to the next village and we were directed to the mechanic. And the mechanic was outside Canapo Canapo nightclub. And it's a, it has multiple meanings, and I love this term on an African talk. The translation is now, right here, right now, there and then, immediate results. Bantu languages stress immediacy by repeating the word, kanapu, kanapu. It also may mean, according to the lead guitarist from Flying Bantu, who we did not see that night because we never got there, it may mean live in the moment and make a plan. And as we know, that Zimbabweans have a saying, which is keep calm, be Zimbabwean and make a plan. So the car surgery was done by a Virgo engineer, a mechanic and a handyman. And I was the torch bearer. It was like trying to stop bleeding without a cautery machine because there was no gas in Kanapo Kanapo and therefore the welding machine didn't work. So we did what we could with innumerable hose clips and sunset came and darkness fell. And this is the photo from that night. It was absolutely beautiful, but we knew we weren't getting to Victoria Falls. So, Canapo Canapo nightclub is painted bright blue with a big red sign. And I learned that a diesel engine is not that different to a human. The difference is with a diesel engine, you can actually turn the engine off and you have time on your side which is not the same in cardiac bypass surgery. So what happens to an engine is not enough oxygen going to the cylinder? What happens if the pump cannot generate the energy and flow to the car and to itself to operate? Well, the cylinder and the pump cannot burn the fuel to generate energy and the engine ceases. And it took me back to 2020 and 2021, particularly in the Delta wave. We would put patients on oxygen and get their sats up to 98 to 99%. But the monitors showed that the pump was putting out an irregular rhythm with very low pressure. Patients remained moribund and confused and progressed to multi-organ failure even when their sats were normal on 10 liters per minute of oxygen. Intubation did not solve the problem, it made it worse. And it's important to understand that when we breathe in, we generate a negative pressure in our chest, which sucks the blood into the lungs. When we intubate and use positive pressure ventilation, we push the blood out of the thorax and we remove the life force. The problem was never in the lungs, the problem was in the fuel, the pipes and the pump. So the pump needs flowing fuel to pump or it fails. And the heart and the bypass system in first world countries, the alternative to getting rid of the heart is to put a patient on ECMO, which is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So we take the blood out of the person, run it through a very complicated system, and that system oxygenates and pumps it back in. And many people in places like Australia have managed to survive severe COVID with this system, but unfortunately was not one of them. ECMO is not available to Zimbabweans in Lupani or Zimbabweans at all. And the thing is, if you are living in Lupani or Zimbabwe, what do you do? In a place that doesn't even have gas for a welding machine, there's definitely no oxygen for the ICU. There's definitely nobody who's even heard of ECMO. And what do you actually do when the engine is about to seize? Peter McCulloch gave us this graph and this picture in December 2020, which shows that you get proliferation of a virus, and this is not limited to COVID, then you get an inflammatory response followed by thrombosis. And all viruses that kill humans, including hemorrhagic fever, which is where thrombosis consumes all your clotting factors and you then bleed, all of them have the same mechanism of action. 
So if we don't have ECMO, how do we get rid of the problem at source? Because the problem is that the blood vessels are sticking, the blood cells are sticking to each other and they're sticking to the blood vessel wall. We have sludging fuel and that's what we saw in 2020, 2021. And what we do know now from studies by Boshi, Celine Boshi, is that positively charged particles, which include the Ebola virus glycoprotein, include the spike protein, basically cause the negatively charged red cells to stick together, when otherwise they would operate as a colloid. And just like cerebral malaria, which also attaches to the CD147 receptor, the blood cells sludge and the kidneys and the brain and the heart stop working. So what did we do? We learned to thin the blood as early as July, 2020. And we made a plan with who and what we had. And we formed a group of 23 frontline doctors who basically put a plan together that involved antiviral, anti-inflammatory, and anti-thrombotic agents. We needed to get the pump to do its job efficiently. And it was not designed to pump molasses while it was starved itself of oxygen. So this is the paper by Boshi et al. Um, includes David Scheim, who hopefully will join this call a little bit later. Um, and these are sample images in vitro of blood that has had spike protein added to it, and it forms a circle, which is coagulation. If it forms a teardrop, there is no coagulation. So the in vivo evidence started on the 8th of August, 2020, when we advised patients to get ivermectin to add to the antiviral and anti-inflammatory protocols, and the deaths literally stopped overnight. And we realized that patients had been dying from a hypoxic cardiac arrest because the heart stopped because it didn't have enough oxygen. And we didn't realize for a very long time that the problem was not in the lungs. It wasn't insufficient oxygen. The lungs were okay. The problem was that the lining of the pipes and the fuel and the pump was dysfunctional. So this is the first slide, the first photographs I sent to David Scheim, who is with MIT in the USA. And this is a picture of a patient who we've oxygenated who's completely moribund. He's lying in bed, he's in kidney failure, he's confused, his brain isn't working, but he is saturating at 98% on 10 liters a minute of oxygen. And we gave him rivaroxaban and we gave him um, ivermectin along with a host of other products, including steroids and zinc ionophores. And at 11.30 at night, he had a rapid 3D irregular pulse with very poor perfusion. And by 6.30 the next morning, he was perfusing perfectly. And he was sitting up in bed on four liters a minute of oxygen and talking and wanting breakfast. And the interesting thing was that his D-dimer had increased from 2,500 to over 10,000. And I'll go into that a little bit later. So we started in September 2020 talking about sequenced multidrug therapy protocols, which Peter McCulloch put into a formal paper in December 2020. And then we presented it all over the world, including the Philippines and Sri Lanka, on the use of quadruple antiviral therapy in COVID-19 in Zimbabwe. However, we thought we were using antiviral therapy, but we were wrong because 50% of what we believe will be wrong in 10 years' time. We just don't know which 50%. Because these people were getting better extraordinarily quickly, and they were already out of the viral phase. So we were not just stopping the viral photocopying machine. We were actually stopping inflammation, and we were stopping thrombosis. So ivermectin should be part of the toolkit to stop myocarditis. And we still didn't understand how it helped in stage patients. But Professor Natiem Tladler, who is um, a cardiothoracic anesthetist and probably the most exceptional intensivist in South Africa, um, who 
reduced the death rate at the George Bakari Hospital from over 21% to less than 11%. He describes putting patients in a side ward on oxygen when there were not enough ventilators. And he gave them ivermectin and they didn't die. Why did they not die? Because this happens when you give ivermectin in combination with Argentum. The oxygen saturations and patient saturating under 80% very rapidly climb into the 90s. And we have 104 patients where we can document this. So did we actually reverse hemagglutination? This is a question that I asked Professor Thomas Barodi and Dr. David Scheim. And the interesting thing was we got our protocols from the Center for Digestive Diseases in Sydney. And Professor Barodi, who is currently getting these protocols through the TGA in Australia with significant resistance, um, basically gave the protocols to Dr. Sabine Hassan, who has presented in Victoria Falls, and gave them to a Canadian doctor who's working in Zimbabwe, who basically, I don't know how she got it out of them, but she got the protocol out of them. So the gray line represents current treatment, which is no different to a year ago and two years before that. This includes remdesivir and it includes monoclonal antibodies. And you can see that the patient deteriorates and on about day five, there is some improvement. If we look at the Nigerian data where they used um, ivermectin and they used vitamin C and zinc, we can see that there's a significant improvement in oxygen saturations. But on different demographics and in different hemispheres, Sabine and I got exactly the same result, which is within 24 hours, we saw a restoration of oxygenation. And that was with ivermectin, doxycycline and zinc, which Professor Barodi predicted in 2020 would end the pandemic within six weeks. The probability of this happening by chance was less than one in a million. In fact, it was one in 10 million. So the p-value for those of you that are interested in the p-value was 0 0.000001, which is highly significant and it's almost impossible that this happened by chance alone. So in vitro, we know that ivermectin reverses hemagglutination. And we know that if we pre-treat red cells, they don't clot. And if we give it after they've clotted, the clot breaks up in the test tube. We also know that in this patient whose name is Joe, and his name really is Joe, his surname is not Bloggs though. Um, but in this patient, what we saw was a restoration of the circulation in association with a very dramatic increase in the D-dimer. The D-dimer is an interesting um, subject because initially I thought this patient was going to die until I realized it was a marker of clot breakdown. So what are the actions that actually help an in-stage patient? Well, the first thing is clot breakdown. And a clump of red cells can't carry oxygen, but several individual red cells, once they are freed, can. We know that in actions that ivermectin is likely to have that contribute to its efficacy in end-stage patients is that it coats the spike. And that comes from computer simulation and computer modeling studies. It was the most likely agent to be like to coat the spike. And it was demonstrated in the test tube that pre and post treatment stop hemagglutination. So what do you get when you use ivermectin is the joke. It's like um, those jokes you told at junior school, you get better. And when you treat with ivermectin and the D-dimer goes up and the patient is getting better, it's because it's a marker of clot breakdown. When I phoned the home nurse when I got the D-dimer results, I told her that we needed to switch to palliative mode because this guy was going to die. And she said, but he's sitting up in bed and he wants to go for a walk. And I said, it's not possible. And then the penny dropped. So in terms of actions that affect the heart, the one of the things that I learned at Critics Care Hospital from Dr. Abu, and I'm not sure if he's still alive, but he taught me, he failed me in my mock exam because I diagnosed someone based on a badly reported chest X-ray. And I was told to treat the patient, not the test. 
And had I treated the test, I would have given Joe morphine and midazolam. But instead, I took the word of one of the best nurses, and there are two of them, that I've ever come across. And I realized in Kanapo Kanapo that fuel injector pump needs a blood supply. And if the fuel injector pump is not getting its own blood supply, the most important part of the engine is unable to function. So this is a Toyota Land Cruiser 100 series fuel injector pipe on the right or fuel injector on the right. And I spent three hours looking at it um, and on the heart. The fuel injector pump also needs a steady flow of oxygenated fuel or it doesn't work. And I spent a very long time with my hands on a torch shining it into an engine to realize that. So the pump was to fix humans. We had to get the pump able to function at full capacity. We had to ensure the pipes were no longer sticky and we had to get rid of the sediment in the fuel. And when we did that in the Toyota Land Cruiser, we were back to operating on six cylinders. Now the heart only has four chambers, which proves that it is inferior to a diesel, a hundred series diesel Land Cruiser. But I knew that already because it is my favorite vehicle of all time. So the second thing that ivermectin does is increase the efficiency of the pump. It's number 20 in the study published in Nature on the mechanisms of action of ivermectin. And what we know now, and this was published in 2017 because they were looking for drugs that were repurposed and affordable that could protect patients in cardiac failure. And they demonstrated that ivermectin allows cardiac muscle to produce energy even in the presence of low oxygen. And that is why Nati's patients lived. Energy is life. Energy comes from mitochondria. And increased cardiac ATP despite low oxygen. The increase in mitochondrial ATP production is the secret to why this particular agent is so effective when added to other combination therapy. It doesn't work on its own. Nothing works on its own. Nothing works for HIV on its own or malaria. It's called coatum because there are two agents in it. Nothing works for helicobacter unless you use combination therapy. And the use of monotherapy is completely illogical. But Nagai who's in Japan in 2017 demonstrated why this agent is so critical to add to end-stage patients. The engine, and when we drove from Kanapo Kanapo to Victoria Falls, we had sealed off one of the cylinders and we went at 60 to 80 Ks for 300 Ks. It took us all day, but it was still possible for us to drive the vehicle, even in the presence of not all cylinders working. And that is the secret to this agent. So if we look at Chris Barnard's assessment that it is true that for a dying person, a transplant is not a difficult decision, then for a dying person, ivermectin is a complete no brainer because it will turn 50 years old this year. And the only person I know who's actually managed to die from it took 88 milligrams per kilogram and we use 0.6. And he took it with alcohol and with warfarin and aspirated into his lungs. And at 72 years old, he died from aspiration, pneumonia, and multi organ failure on day 18. Mm. So I think the only way that you can possibly die from the substance is if you drown in it. And good luck trying to find enough to drown in. So, what is the worst thing that could happen if we use this agent? We will have a population of parasite-free people. And it's important to note that we used our gentum with this and our diarrhea does not affect dark-skinned people. So it might affect myself, but it's unlikely to affect most of Africa. 
The FDA said there was insufficient evidence, but the same regulators simultaneously approved the use of an injection that generated spike protein, which I think we've already demonstrated through COVID can cause blood cells to clot and can cause significant disturbances. So if we look at the heart as a very complex pump, what does it need? It needs muscle, it needs an arterial supply, and it needs coordinated electrical activity. Peter McCulloch has demonstrated on several occasions that the spike protein can affect muscle by causing myocarditis. It affects the blood supply by causing clots in the coronary artery system, which is your standard heart attack. And we've had several presentations in Zimbabwe with these inexplicable high numbers of heart attacks in young people. And it can affect the conduction system. And basically, if you get a charged particle that bypasses the atrioventricular node, you are going to get a re-entry circuit and the atria and the ventricles are going to contract simultaneously, which means there's no filling pressure in the left ventricle or the right ventricle, which means that you drop your blood pressure to zero because you can't, pressure is dependent on volume and resistance. And if there's no volume, there's no blood pressure. So getting to the heart of the matter, spike protein pretty much covers all bases in terms of seizing the engine, stopping the pump, stopping the fuel supply to the pump, stopping the oxygen getting to the pump. But ivermectin actually works to counteract all of this. And in our experience as demonstrated, in the patient, Joe, it also restores cardiac rhythm. So when we get back to constructive controversy, Western and advanced countries often undermine the value of African data. We're told that we can't count and the South Americans suffer from the same problem. But what is good for the goose is not always good for the gander. And we don't have ECMO and we don't have ICUs and we also don't have mammograms in this country for all the 15 million people that would benefit from them. We have, I think there are two in the private sector and I'm not sure if the ones in the public sector are working. So we are worlds apart in terms of our resources. We are worlds apart in terms of our genetics and we are worlds apart in terms of our resources. And we must do what we can, and we must do the best we can with the resources that we have in Africa. We can go on to discuss the brave hearts, but that is a topic for another day. Um, and I do know that the person who is in this photograph is a strong fan of the substance that we have been discussing. So let's get back to happier things, back to Valentine's Day. What is love? So Gandhi said, where there is love, there is life. And we all know the Corinthians quote, but love rejoices with the truth. And that is what I want to emphasize today. Love is also a verb and it involves sweat equity. So I'd encourage everyone in this group to look at the world with rose tinted glasses because positivity is infectious and we shouldn't just do it on Valentine's Day. It may also protect your sanity and your relationships with your colleagues. So getting back to love is in the air and my true love, which is aviation medicine. Let's talk about the Bible of aviation medicine, which is Ernstein and Young. And I might've got their names wrong. Ernstein and King, I apologize. They are both air vice marshals. And this slab of a book um, took me about six months to study in depth. But the book is about risk management. What is acceptable risk? What is the risk of sudden incapacitation in pilots? What is acceptable? Because no activity in life is risk-free. What is the risk of subtle incapacitation? And what is acceptable risk in a cockpit with 300 to 500 people in the back of the aircraft? 
So I'd like to tell you a case study that happened in 2002 before we had cardiac MRIs. The case is a man called Mike. He's a 37-year-old airline captain, or he was in 2002. He's a lot older than that now. He had a son aged of about four years old at the time, um, and his wife was pregnant with their second child. He presented with epigastric and retrosternal pain and was quite stressed um, with his flight roster and with the um, responsibility of another child when he already had an impossible four-year-old. And a non avmed doctor diagnosed gastroesophageal reflux disease and started a meprazole, and he was advised he was fit to fly as the operating captain to London that night. The flight was departing at 10 p.m. to London, Gatwick. The triage nurse, whose name is Susie, and if she's on this call, you know who you are because you saved this man's life and you also saved the life of many people in the back of that aeroplane. But the nurse was a NHS direct trained nurse and to make the doctor's life easier, she triaged this patient and did an ECG, which as you will see, does not have a computerized readout. But anybody who is a well-trained GP will spot immediately that from V1 to V6, there's T-wave inversion in all of the lateral leads. This man's left ventricle is in trouble. And he was hypotensive and he was tachycardic and he was gray and he looked like he was having a heart attack. And the nurse came to me and I had to cancel my entire mornings, in fact, my whole day's um, schedule because we had to be very politically correct about overriding the decision that this man needed a meprazole because this man needed cardiac ICU. And I then got his cardiac enzymes back, which were absolutely through the roof. But I couldn't afford to stress him out because otherwise he would have an arrest in a clinic that wasn't equipped for it. So I've made a call to somebody who... Um, whose name is Rob, who did the best epidural I've ever had in my life when I was in labor. And Rob can stab me in the back anytime he likes because he does a damn good spinal. But Rob then said, look, get him here because the ambulance will take him to the state hospital and they don't have a CCU. So we took him to that hospital. And Rob confirmed that there was clear T-wave inversion in all of the lateral leads. And when we got to the hospital where I told them we were just going for an echo because I wasn't really comfortable with his ECG, what we saw was casualty on the left, but we went straight ahead and he said, where are we going? And I said, just get in the lift. And we went to the second floor and we got him straight into cardiac intensive care or CCU. At exactly 1.03 in the morning, he went into ventricular fibrillation. If he had been allowed to fly that night, he would have been the operating captain going into one of the airports that has one of the most difficult air traffic controls because Heathrow and Gatwick have their own independent systems and they deal with enormous numbers coming through. And in the ideal world, you see two pilots that are wide awake at night. But in the real world, you wouldn't know whether these pilots are asleep or dead. And the first officer probably wouldn't have noticed that the captain was actually dead in his seat. And he would have been dead if he hadn't been defibrillated. He was successfully defibrillated immediately because every monitor went off in the unit. And the next morning he had an angiogram which showed squeaky clean coronary arteries. So there was nothing wrong with this man's supply to his heart. And this is in 2002, before SARS-CoV-1 even hit us. So what is the diagnosis? We have a 37-year-old man with retrosternal pain, which he said went down his left arm. And the night before he saw the GP, he thought he was having a heart attack. His ECG shows T-wave inversion. His cardiac enzymes are high and he's thrown in arrhythmia. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. It's called myocarditis. And there is no such thing as mild myocarditis in a safety critical environment because ventricular fibrillation is a very real complication. This pilot's life was saved by Susie. And if you're on this call, Susie, I take my hat off to you. Potentially, so do 300 passengers and the crew on this aircraft. So how does an aeromedical examiner diagnose myocarditis? Well, you usually diagnose, diagnose it with sudden death and arrhythmia or cardiac chest pain with collapse. And if you're going to make that diagnosis at uh 
altitude of 40,000 feet over the middle of the Atlantic or the Pacific, you've got a problem. There are no well-determined criteria to diagnose it because most cases are asymptomatic until there is an arrhythmia or there's sudden death. So what is the 1% rule that I refer to in Ernst Dean's Bible? It governs pilot incapacitation. It governs safety critical parts of flight, which is predominantly the landing and the takeoff. And it is based on the assumption that there is a co-pilot. So the acceptable level of risk of incapacitation in a multi-crew environment is 1% per year. And it is compatible with the airworthiness requirements of aircraft. So the 737 is not something that I would choose to fly on these days. I'd far rather fly in a 777 or a 340, um, even though I'm not a fan of Airbus, but I'll take my chances with an Airbus 340 twin engine rather than a 737, because the 737 is increasingly being shown to not be airworthy. And should we be accepting the same in air crew? And the vital mitigating factor is the presence of another healthy pilot on a serviceable commercial aircraft. So it applies to sudden incapacitation in critical phases of flight. But subtle incapacitation is a thousand times more dangerous because people don't notice when somebody is subtly incapacitated. Now, the only sudden incapacitation in neurology is a seizure, and that is incompatible with the flight environment because in the tonic and the clonic phase of the fit, the rudders will be affected by the legs going into a clonic phase and you'll tear off the tail of the aircraft and that will be the end of that. So epileptic pilots are basically confined to a simulator to train. But the real danger is undetected frontal lobe dysfunction. And I have no way of detecting whether this pilot on the right without full psychometric testing has got a normally functional front frontal lobe or if he's just smiling and waving at me. So we know from the Department of Defense stats in the US that there was a 4% chance of myocarditis per annum and there was a 36% chance of neuropsychiatric conditions. Both do not comply with the 1% rule. So at the risk of mentioning the elephant in the room, and there were many at Victoria Falls, none of which are in the room, they were all outside the gate, but the public put their, hand, their lives in the hands of pilots and doctors, and they were the first to have injections that had not been through phase four clinical trials. So to stop ivermectin and approve these medications, it's a real concern. Are a third of pilots at risk of neuropsychiatric disease and are a third of the doctors who are licensing them also effective, affected? So who's liable? If our pilot does crash an airplane and I've licensed him, am I liable? Is the airline liable? How does the aeromedical examiner detect subtle frontal lobe disease? It involves working memory. There are about 30 air traffic control changes going into London Heathrow, and I've sat in the cockpit in part, as part of my training to understand the amount of information processing. And what you have to do is repeat exactly what the air traffic controller has said. You need a working memory. You need attention. You need to be processing information at high speed. If there's anything unexpected, you need to plan and problem solve. And you have to repeat what the air traffic controller has said back to them. And if you have problems with recall, and this is being increasingly reported in the pilot world, you are going to have a problem because you're going to switch to the wrong channel. And what about the air traffic controllers? They're one up. So when a London Heathrow ATC was asked how many aeroplanes does he handle an hour, he says about 60 to 70 departing and about the same arriving. And it's more than, um, it's probably about 140 to 150 aircraft an hour that they're managing. And they're doing it with no backup. There's no 
co-pilot sitting next to them understanding exactly what's happening in the air they have to multitask and they have to be able to see in 3d in fact in 4d at speed what is a captain only airport and the answer is some airports are extremely challenging there's one in kenya there's one in mexico city they're high altitude they're over seven thousand feet and they have multiple air traffic control regulations and it gets confusing. So if we look at air traffic control in Mexico City, which is a place where a pilot who I was looking after, who had developed a blood clot in his leg and actually had a DVT when he landed as the operating captain into Mexico City, they have about over a thousand aircraft movements per day. It is the busiest two runway airport in the world, and it's at over 7,000 feet above sea level. It has two parallel runways that are too close to each other to operate them both simultaneously, and it needs an air traffic controller that has all his marbles about him. So I'm just asking the question as to whether this is safe. What is acceptable risk in aviation? What is acceptable risk to flight safety? What is acceptable risk to the life and the livelihood of someone who has taken decades to train? What is the risk to the airline industry who could lose a loyal pilot and worse still, a hull, which is an aircraft? And they will pay dearly in medical bills, loss of license payouts, but they will also have to replace a highly skilled member of staff. What is acceptable risk in medicine? What is acceptable risk to patient safety of 36% chance of neuropsychiatric disease? What is the risk to the life and the livelihood of doctors and nurses and people who put their life on the line for the people who make these rules? What is the risk to the medical industry who could lose a healthcare worker for life? And what we've seen is the medical industry don't seem to be particularly worried about retaining staff until they threaten to go on strike. Moving on to disease X, which is suspected to be Ebola and Marburg. It's going to be a worst form of COVID. It may kill 20 times as many people. It's a hypothetical disorder, but it doesn't really matter what it is because the mechanism of action of all of these things is the same and the treatment is the same and the treatment needs to be initiated earlier. There is light at the end of the tunnel and this is a fire in Kanapo Kanapo because we made a campfire at 11 o'clock at night on Old Year's Eve. And this is what happens when you reduce your shutter speed. So talking around the campfire, these protocols should treat all respiratory viruses and all RNA viruses of which the hemorrhagic fevers are included. So we need African solutions for African problems. The alternative is quarantine, lockdown and economic collapse. Ebola is also a disease of the endothelium precipitated by a cytokine storm, and the same treatments are expected to work. We know that with Ebola, the endothelium is not such a big deal. It's more immune-mediated mechanisms, but we know that we have the ability to suppress these mechanisms, and we know that the D-dimer goes up three days before hemorrhage happens. So we know that if we treat with heparin and with rivaroxaban and with ivermectin, we are likely to stop the hemorrhage. So as I discussed, the with COVID, it stopped at thrombosis. When you consume your clotting factors, you have hemorrhage. So the hemorrhagic fevers will be treated by all of these things. I'd like to introduce a new medication that is going through the TG at the moment called Zyvodox. It has been produced by Topelia and the caption is good docs use Zyvodox. And we hope sincerely that the African data will contribute towards the passing of this drug. And we hope sincerely that it will be available at a much cheaper price in Africa because it will retail at 400 Australian dollars for a 10 day course. So impossible is temporary, which is actually in the words of Muhammad Ali. And we need African solutions for African problems. And on Valentine's Day, let's sit down around a table and have an open discussion in a safe and authentic environment. And if it's not us, who will it be? 
And if it's not now, when? So with that, we have 10 minutes left for questions. Um, and I'm opening it to the floor. Bell, I can't see the chat. Are there any questions on the chat? No, there aren't. I can see the chat. Yes, there's, we have a hand raised from Helen, but prior to that, there is a question or more of a comment. Maybe we can invite him to. Is Doc, Dr. Charnay Gerber? Yep, go ahead. So what is Shar? Yeah, I'm, I'm into it now. Um, the comment is Zyvodox zinc, ivermectin, and doxycycline. Excellent. So um, I know Shane has um, treated a lot of patients in her time, and she's um, also one of the samurai. Um, Satoshi Omura named seven samurai who had um, fought the corner, and ivermectin will turn 50 this year, and his book will be published in the Japanese spring when the cherry blossoms come out. So we look forward to that. And Shana, I'm sure you'll enjoy reading the, South Af the Southern African chapter. So Helen, please go ahead and mute your mic. Hi, Jackie. Thank you so much from Cape Town. <clears throat> As always, your lectures are amazing and I'm sure everyone would agree with me. Um, Jackie, I was just wondering about the whole myocarditis thing. Because um, I've got a, a few patients who've had vaccine injuries and presented with shortness of breath and palpitations and um, chest pain. And the one girl uh, went to three cardiologists and not one of them did a magnetic resonance imaging of her heart. They only did echoes, three cardiologists and said there was nothing wrong with her. Um, she's a professional cyclist. And I just wondered why did they not do an MRI? I mean, I'm a GP, I'm not a cardiologist. And I just wondered if that is not the gold standard, which I understood it was to diagnose myocarditis. I mean, am I wrong with that? No, you're absolutely correct. But I think that the one thing that I found very disturbing is the, um, is the division that has been created between the specialist world and the primary care providers. And I know for a fact that people who were using ivermectin in Zimbabwe, bear in mind, we don't have mRNA vaccines here. Yeah. So people will tell me I'm an anti-vaxxer and I'm not because I don't really care because we don't, well, I do care, but I don't see it because we don't have the injections that you have there. So um, I'm an early treatment proponent because it makes sense because malaria and HIV and helicobacter respond to early combination therapy. So, um, but yes, it is the gold standard, but I think the atmosphere of fear is important. I think that the consequences, um, you just have to see that Nartian Kladler has just been pulled up in front of the HPCSA yep. and his case was changed from tweets about concern about injections. Mm -hmm. And they admitted in his hearing that the injections were causing myocarditis. So they changed his hearing to a tweet about epilepsy and he will be disciplined and fined on that basis. So there's a culture of fear that is propagated by the regulators, but bear in mind who funds the regulators. And when you see who funds the regulators, I mean, how many people in regulation got a Nobel Prize? Yeah. So they're dependent on their job. And there is a saying that when you have people by a certain part of their anatomy, their hearts and minds will follow. And these people have salaries and mortgages and school fees that are reliant on their compliance with the system. And one of the things that Zimbabwe is remarkably blessed with is that nobody will lend anybody any money. Nobody in Zimbabwe has a mortgage. Nobody has a car loan. You eat what you kill. And so we are much more able to speak out 
because we are not mortgaged to the hilt, which most South African doctors are and most doctors around the globe are. They have to choose between their child's education, their marriage, their mortgage, and what their brain is telling them. And it's one of the reasons that I think Zimbabwe has been so blessed is that we have no personal debt. Mm. And I think that's important to understand. I also think that the medical aids have enslaved the medical profession and Absolutely. people are working so hard to see enough people to actually cover the costs of their registration and their surgeries and their nursing staff and everything else that is thrown at them. And they have to follow the NICE guidelines, which means if you've got a breast patient, they have to have triple investigations. And then and, 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 and they get on this insanely manic mill and they don't have time to think. And so... They just follow the guidelines because if you follow the guidelines, doing nothing doesn't get you into trouble. But doing yeah. something definitely, definitely does. Thank you. I thought I was going mad, but clearly not not right now. I have the privilege of double jeopardy. <laughs> I've already been disciplined <laughs> by the council and I've already been found not guilty in a court of law. So, as somebody said to me the other day, what more? I mean, I'm ridiculed on doctors' groups and I'm made out to be um, a maverick. Um, I got told I was badass the other day and I was really offended until one of my kids told me it's actually a compliment. <laughs> so... Um, I'm in a very, very fortunate and privileged situation to be able to talk to people from a position where I've won in court and the medical council will have I'm to come up to me with a new complaint. Most doctors are not in that position. They and most are hamstrung. Thanks, Jackie. Clearly being in aviation medicine, is it's helpful to have the nickname of Maverick. Yes. Well... People who have a diploma in aviation medicine have huge respect for other people who have a diploma. Yeah. So we don't necessarily think in terms of guidelines, we think in strategy. Thanks very much. Good evening. I've got an unstable connection, so I'm cutting my video off. Good evening, Dr. Jackie. We are so proud. So for the information you are giving us, and this training is very, very important in the medical field. Thank you. Continue to update it us. Thank you. I shall do. I'm sure I will... Um... I'm sure I will have some resistance, but the point is that we should be able to voice this. There's a desperation in the young doctors to hear common sense and the truth. Um, and I may be shunned by the physicians and the cardiologists, but the medical students are all over me in the meetings and they're hungry for knowledge. So I really hope that the knowledge I can transmit makes a difference to people in Sub-Saharan Africa. All right, we're at 28 minutes past seven, which um, I spoke faster than I expected to. Um, this was recorded in case it went down, which I expected it to do, and I'm pleasantly surprised that it hasn't um, gone off. So if there are any other questions in terms of AvMed, the question I would like to ask is really if I were to license a doctor or a pilot as fit to work in a safety-critical environment, and they mess up 
and somebody dies or many people die. If there are lawyers on this call and I can see at least one, I'd like to know who technically would be liable. So is it the airline? Is it the nurse who gave the injection? Is it the aeromedical examiner? Is it the Department of Health that instructed the airline to do what they did? Or is it the manufacturing company? So if anybody has a legal opinion on that, I would be really interested to know it. We have some very quiet lawyers on this group. So I can actually answer that question because I'm dealing with a legal case at the moment. Um, and the answer to that question is that they're all liable. But you sue the person you're most likely to get any money out of. And then they will blame somebody else. And that person will blame somebody else. And then you have multiple defendants. So there are cases in progress at the moment. There are class action suits in Australia. Um, but at the end of the day, my experience with pilots who have cancer and who are never, ever going to fly again is that the only thing they want to do is get better. And the advice that they receive from those people who treat them is that anger and bitterness will only make it worse. So they don't act. And then some of them take medical advice that comes from the allopathic world because medical aid will only pay for certain services. And unfortunately, um, Bud Cocroft was one of those. So I salute Bud. I salute his music. I salute his flying skills. I found out at his memorial service what an unbelievable helicopter pilot he was. He was also an exceptional drummer and an exceptional guitarist and a vocalist. So those are real. We might not have these injections in Zimbabwe, but Zimbabweans who I know and care about and who've been patients of mine since the late 1990s are, are no longer with us. And I can't come up with an alternative explanation. So on that note, before I get taken down off YouTube, I think we should end it unless there are any pressing questions. Because we're running on Namibian time and it's now 19.30. And I'm sure you all have much better things to do with Valentine's Day. I certainly do. And we'll be there in about 15 minutes. So can we stop recording, please, Pride?